All right, good morning. I'm going to get started. We are starting today with the Srima Devi Bhagavatam. Um, we are in uh, book three, starting with chapter six. So we're starting in with during the visit of the Trimurti of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva to the Mani Dvipa Loka of Bhuvaneshwari Devi um, after they have just addressed her with prayers and questions. And this chapter begins with her response. Brahma said, Brahma said, when I thus asked with great humility, the Devi Bhagavati, the Parashakti, she, um, addressed me thus in the following sweet words. There is oneness always between me and the Purusha. There is no difference whatsoever at any time between me and the Purusha, the um, male principle or the, or the Supreme Self. Who is I? That is Purusha. Who is Purusha? That is I. The difference between Shakti and the receptacle of Shakti is due to error, or in other words, the perception of difference between them. He who knows the subtle difference between us two is certainly intelligent. He is freed from this bondage of sansara. There is no manner of doubt in this. So in this, she, from one sentence to the next, expresses a seeming paradox on the surface level, saying that the perception of difference between them is due to error, but though, but one who knows the subtle difference is intelligent, that, that there is some distinction, but it is very subtle. The one secondless, eternal, everlasting Brahman substance becomes dual at the time of creation. As a lamp, though one becomes two by virtue of adjuncts, in other words, um, like the reflection of light. As a face, though one becomes two as reflected in a mirror, as one man becomes double by his shadow, so we become reflected into many by virtue of different antakaranas, or inner organs of mind, buddhi and ahankara, created by maya. So in other words, the illusion of difference refracts the single image of the one Brahman into an infinitude of different in, um, ahankara or sense of I-ness into an infinite sense of self-perceived individual minds. The necessity of creation again and again after the prakrat pralayas is due to the fructification of those karmas of the jivas whose fruits were not enjoyed before the pralayas. So when creation again commences, the above said differences are found to appear. Brahman is the material cause of these changes. Without Brahman as the basis, the existence of Maya is simply impossible. It is therefore that in Maya and Maya's actions, Brahman is interwoven. For this reason, as many differences are found in Maya, so many differences exist in Brahman. Um, incidentally, I've mentioned this in past weeks, but this copy that I'm reading of the Devi Bhagavatam was my father's old copy. He starred that paragraph right there. Occasionally, he made notes in here as particularly of significance to him. Uh, he also starred this next paragraph. The Maya and Brahman appear as two, and hence all the differences, visible and invisible, have come forth. Only during creation are these differences conceived. When everything melts away, i.e. there comes the pralaya or general dissolution, then I am not female, I am not male, nor am I hermaphrodite. I then remain as Brahman with maya latent in it. During the time of creation, I am sri, or wealth, buddhi, intellect, dritti, fortitude, smriti, memory, sraddha, faith, medha, intelligence, um, and that's also a name of Sarasvati. Daya, uh, mercy or compassion. Lajja, modesty. Kshudha, 
hunger, prashna, thirst, kshama, forgiveness, akshama, non-forgiveness, kanti, luster, shanti, peace, pipasa, um, another form of thirst, nidra, sleep, tandra, drowsiness, jara, old age, ajara, non-old age or youthfulness, vidya, knowledge, avidya, non-knowledge or ignorance, spraha, desires, vancha, uh, another form of desires, shakti or force, ashakti or weakness, vasa, fat, as in the fat substance within bodies, majja, marrow, within bones, tvak, skin, drishti or sight, Satya satya vakya, true and false words. And it is I that become para, madhyama, pasyanti, etc., the innumerable nadis in the body. There are three koti and a half nadis, or 35 million nadis in the body. O Brahma, see what substance is there in this samsara that is separate from me, and what can you imagine with which I am not connected? So know this as certain that I am all these forms. O creator, say, is there any such thing where you will not see my above-mentioned positive form? So in this creation I am one, and I am, as many, and I am many as well, in various forms. Know this as certain that it is I, that assuming the names of all the various devas exist in so many forms of shaktis, it is I that manifest power and wield strength. O Brahma, I am Gauri, Brahmi, Raudri, Varahi, Vaishnavi, Shiva, Varuni, Kauveri, Narasinghi, and Vasavi Shaktis. I enter in every substance. So that list that, of names that was just given there, um, that is the, um, the Matraka Shaktis, or the Shaktis within the major uh, Deva forms. I enter in every substance in everything of the nature of effect. Making that Purusha the, the instrument, I do all the actions. Rather, Purusha is the efficient cause, the immediate agent. Because Shakti being force is the force that anything exerts in performing any action. I am the coolness in water, the heat in fire, the luster in the sun, the cooling rays in the moon, and thus I manifest my strength. O Brahma, Verily, I tell you this as certain, that this universe becomes motionless if it be abandoned by me. If I leave Shankara, he will not be able to kill the Daityas. A very weak man is declared to be as without any strength. Uh, he is not said to be without, uh, or, or without any Shakti. He is not said to be without Rudra or without Vishnu. Nobody says this. Everyone says he is without strength, without Shakti. Those who get fallen, tumbled, afraid, quiet, or under one's enemies are called powerless or ashakti. No one says that this man is rudraless or so forth. So the creation that you perform, no shakti, power, to be the cause thereof. When you will be endowed with that shakti, you will be able to create this whole universe. Hari, Rudra, Indra, Agni, Chandra, Surya, Yama, Vishvakarma, Varuna, Pavana, and other devas are all able to do their karmas when they are united respectively with their shaktis. This earth, when united with shakti, remains fixed and becomes capable to hold all the jivas and beings. And if this earth be devoid of shakti, she cannot hold even an atom. Thus Ananta, Kurma, and all the other elephants of the eight points of the compass become able to do their respective works only by my help when united with me, the shakti. O lotus-born, if I wish, I can drink all the fire and waters today, and I can hold the wind in check. I do whatever I wish. If I say that I am creating this world, and the inconsistency arises thus, when I am everything, then I being eternal, all this universe made up of prapancha becomes eternal. Whereas this universe is not eternal in the sense that it is changing. If it were said that this universe is different from me, then my saying that I am everything becomes inconsistent. Thinking thus, do not plunge yourself in the doubt as to the reality and origin and separateness of the non-eternal universe. For what is unreal, how can that come into existence? The unreal substances can never come into existence, as the child of a barren woman. The flowers in the sky are simply absurdities. What is real can only be born. In discussing about origin, birth, etc., the appearance and disappearance of real things is called their birth and dissolution. 
and the clod of earth, there exists the previous existence of the jar. Um, and this is the cause of the appearance of the jar. The disappearance of the jar exists in the jar. Hence, this disappearance is the cause of the destruction of the jar. So to explain what this means, if a clay jar has been pulverized back into particles of, uh, uh, particles of earth, in the clod of earth, there exists the previous existence of the jar. And it is the cause of the appearance of the jar, um, that it can be made into a jar again. The disappearance of the jar exists in the jar in that it is a finite and destructible object that cannot last forever. Sooner or later, the jar will be broken and destroyed. Um, and then this disappearance or temporariness, finiteness, is the cause of the destruction of the jar. Thus the appearance and disappearance of the causal eternal things are called the origin and pralaya. Similarly, in discussing on the causal nature, there does not arise any inconsistency in my being everything. So there is nothing to fear. In discussing about the reality of effects, this is to be conceived that today there does not exist here the earth in the form of the jar. If it is destroyed, where, where has it gone? The conclusion is that the earth in the form of the jar exists in atoms. O Brahman, all substances, eternal, existing for a moment only, the void, and the substances of nature, real and unreal both, are due to a cause. Ahankara is born first among them. First among causes, ahankara, the sense of I-ness, the individuation of consciousness. Thus, substances are of seven kinds, mahat, etc. Here she's referencing the Sankhya system of philosophy and not explaining it in detail. She's assuming that uh, Brahma, who she's speaking to, understands it. O unborn one, mahat first arises from prakriti. From mahat springs ahankara. And from ahankara arises other substances. So to explain what this means, uh, since she's just assuming that it's understood, as the basic oneness of the universe, well, the universe is actually the wrong word. We're talking on a level before there is a universe. The basic oneness of being um, diversifies into two. It diversifies into Purusha and Prakriti, or what they are called in Sankhya, or Shiva and Shakti in Tantra. From Prakriti, the principle of the forces of nature, arise of Mahatattva, the primal substance, the beginnings of matter. And it's heterogeneous. What from, pra from Prakriti arises heterogeneity, that over here is in some way different from over there. And since consciousness or purusha or the Shiva principle permeates all of it, it starts to have a perspective. The consciousness over here perceives things a little differently than the consciousness over there because they have perspective. And from this springs ahankara, the sense of I-ness, that the consciousness over here starts to think of itself differently from the consciousness over there because they perceive things differently. And that's where individual the, the one consciousness of the universe starts to group itself into separate individualities. And that continues in an essentially a fractal way, infinitely, and produces infinite individual beings in the phenomenal universe. Thus, from ahankara arises other substances. Thus, in this order, you go on creating this universe. O Brahma, now you better go to your respective places. And after creating the universe, remain there and perform your respective functions or ordained by Prarabdha. Take this beautiful, great Shakti Maha Sarasvati, full of Rajoguna and of a smiling nature. This Shakti, wearing white clothes, adorned with divine ornaments and sitting on Varasana, will always be your playmate. This beautiful woman will always be your boon companion. Consider her as my Vibhuti, or um, my um, manifestation. I'm so most worshipful. Never show any sort of disrespect towards her. Take her and go immediately to Satyaloka, and from the seed of Mahatattva, create the fourfold beings from these. The linga sharira, or the, the subtle bodies, and the karmas are remaining mixed up with each other. 
separate, in other words, in unmanifest seed form. Separate them as before, duly, in due time. Now go on as before, and according to kala, karma, and svabhava, time, action, and in, um, inherent nature of individual beings, join them with their respective attributes. In other words, bestow fruits according to their gunas and prarabdha karmas, and to the time when these fruits are due. Vishnu is prominent in sattva guna and hence superior to you, so you should always respect and worship him. Whenever any difficulty will come to you, Vishnu will come down on earth to fulfill your ends. Funnily enough, um, my father starred that as well. Her telling Brahma Vishnu is prominent in sattva guna and hence superior to you. Janardana Vishnu will sometimes be born in the wombs of birds and animals. He is sometimes born in the wombs of women and to destroy the Danavas. The highly powerful Mahadeva too will help you. Now create the devas and enjoy as you like. The Brahmanas, Kshatriyas, and Vaishyas will worship you with devotion and various yagnas endowed with do dakshinas. All the devas will be always satisfied when my name, Swaha, will be uttered in the yagna oblations and ceremonies when each offering is made into the consecrated fire. Shiva, the, incarna uh, the incarnation of Tamoguna, will be revered and worshipped by all persons in every yajna. When the devas will be frightened by the daityas, then Varahi, Vaishnavi, Gauri, Narasinghi, Shachi, Shiva, and my other shaktis will take excellent bodies and destroy your fear. So, O lotus-born, be at your ease and do work. Utter and repeat my nine-lettered mantra with bija and dhyan and do your karma. This is the mantra in which she gave initiation in the last chapter. O oh, highly intelligent one, this nine-lettered mantra is the best of all the mantras. You are to keep this mantra within your heart for the accomplishment of all your ends. Thus saying to me, said Brahma, Bhagavati smiled and began to say to Vishnu, O oh, Vishnu, take this beautiful Mahalakshmi and go. She will always reside within your breast. There is no doubt in this. This all-auspicious giving shakti I give to you for your enjoyment. You should always show respect to her, never show hatred or contempt. For the good of the world, I unite thus Lakshmi and Narayana. For your sustenance, I create yajna. You three will act together in harmony, unanimously. Lakshmi, Narayana, and yajna. You, Brahma, and Shiva are my three devas born of my gunas. You three will undoubtedly be respected and worshipped by the world. The stupid man who will find any difference between you three will go to Naraka. There is no doubt in this. He who is Hari is Shiva. He who is Shiva is Hari. To make difference between these will lead one toward Naraka. So Brahma is one and the same with Shiva and Vishnu. There is no manner of doubt in this. O Vishnu, but there are other differences in their gunas. I will tell this. Listen. As far as meditation of the Supreme Self is concerned, you will have Sattva Guna predominant within you, and Rajo Guna and Tamo Guna will be secondary. In various other pursuits and Vikaras, changes, uh, so in other words, when, uh, when engaging in pursuits, not inward meditation, but outward pursuits to cause changes, it is better to have uh, Rajo Guna with Lakshmi and always enjoy her. Um, so better to avail oneself of the power of Rajoguna when engaging in pursuits to cause changes outwardly and to worship Lakshmi for such purpose. O Lord of Rama. So Rama, with the second syllable long, is the name of Lakshmi. So she's addressing Vishnu as O Lord of Rama. I give you Vak Bija, Kama Bija, and Maya Bija that will lead you to the highest end, these three Bija mantras. The seeds of speech, of pleasure and of illusion. Take this mantra and repeat it and enjoy as you like. O Vishnu, by this, the danger of death caused by time will never come to you. When the creation of this universe will be completely done, I will then destroy the, this whole thing, moving and non-moving. You all will then be dissolved in me. You should add pranava to this mantra, meaning put om on the front of the mantra, with kama bija leading to moksha, and repeat it always with auspicious motives. 
O Purushottama, build your Vaikuntapuri, live there and think of this my eternal form and enjoy as you like. Brahma said, saying thus to Vasudeva, that higher Prakriti Devi, who is all of the three gunas and yet transcending them, began to address Mahadeva, the Deva di Deva, the Deva of the Devas, in sweet words thus. O Shankara, accept this beautiful Mahakali Gauri, build a new Kailasa city and live there happily. The pairing of the names Kali Gauri is significant as well in that it literally means um, black white or, or dark bright. Uh, the name Kali referring to her dark aspect and Gauri referring to her bright uh, or fair aspect. Build a new Kailasa city and live there happily. Your primary gunas will be tamas. Sattva and rajas will be your secondary gunas. Have recourse to rajo and tamo gunas while you slay the asuras and thus wander. O sinless Shankara, have recourse to peaceful sattva guna when you reflect on the supreme self and practice austerities. You all are for creating, preserving, and destroying the universe, and you are all of the three gunas. There is no such thing in this world as devoid of these three gunas. Everything that is visible is endowed with the three gunas, and whatever there will be or was before cannot exist without them. Only the supreme self is without these gunas, but that self is not visible. O Shankara, I am the Paraprakriti. At times I appear with gunas, and at other times I remain without any gunas. O Shambhu, I am always of the causal nature. Never am I of the nature of effect. When I am causal, I am with gunas. And when I am before the highest purusha, I am then without any gunas on account of my remaining in the state of samyavastha, the state of equilibrium or absolute sameness. Mahattattva, ahankara, and sound, touch, etc. All the gunas perform the work of samsara day and night, each preceding one being the cause and each subsequent one being the effect. Never do they cease in their activities. From the sattvastu, the reality, springs ahankara or avyakta. Therefore, I am of the nature of causality. Again, ahankara is embodied with the three gunas, and so the pundits call it as an effect of mine. From ahankara arises mahattattva. This is denominated as buddhi. So mahattattva is the effect and ahankara is the cause. From mahattattva arises again another ahankara. From this second ahankara, arise the five tanmatras, or the subtle elements. From these five tanmatras, the five gross elements arrive after a process called panchikarana. From the sattvika part of the five tanmatras arise the five organs of perception. From their rajasic part, the five organs of action come. From their panchikarana come the five gross elements. From the sattvika portion of all the five elements comes mind. Thus, 16 things come into existence. These organs of perception, etc., and other effects, together with the Mahabhutas, form one gana, composed of the 16 categories. The original Purusha is the Supreme Self. He is neither cause nor is he any effect. O Shambhu, at the beginning of the creation, all the above things are born, in the way already indicated. Thus I have described to you in brief about the creation. O Devas, now get up in your aeroplane and go to your respective places and fulfill your respective duties. Whenever you get into any dire distress, then remember me. I will appear before you. O Devas, you should remember always the eternal supreme self and me. When you will remember us both, all your actions will no doubt be crowned with success. Brahma said, Bhagavati Durga gave us shaktis, full of divine beauty and luster. She gave Mahalakshmi to Vishnu, Mahakali to Shiva, and Mahasaraswati to me, and bade goodbye to us. Thus given farewell to by the Devi, we three went to another place and were born as males. We thought of the very wonderful nature and influence of the Devi, and we got upon our divine aeroplane. When we ascended, we saw there was no Manidvipa, there was no Devi, there was no ocean of nectar, nothing whatsoever. Save our aeroplane, we did not see anything. Um, we then, in our wide aeroplane, reached there where Vishnu killed the two indomitable Daityas in the great ocean where I was born from the lotus. Thus ends the sixth chapter of the third skandha on the description of the Devi's Vibhutis and the Mahapurana Srimad Devi Bhagavatam 
of 18,000 verses by Maharshi Veda Vyasa. Chapter 7. Brahma said, O Narada, thus we three, I, Vishnu, and Mahadeva, saw that highly effulgent goddess. We also saw separately her attendant goddesses, one after another, that form, as it were, a veil to her, um, uh, her uh, a veil of the various forms which were also preeminently grand, veiling her true inner nature. Vyasa said, so this is um, in the frame uh, of this narration, this is Vyasa narrating a conversation between Brahma and Narada to the king, Janamejaya. Vyasa said, O king, Narada, the foremost of the Munis, hearing thus his father's words, was exceedingly pleased and asked, O grandsire of all the Lokas, now describe in detail that ancient and indestructible, undecaying, unchangeable, eternal Purusha, that is Nirguna, free from prakritic qualities, that you have seen and realized. Father, you have seen the Shakti, the prime energy personified, the Saguna energy, the supreme goddess having hands and feet, but I cannot understand of what kind is that Nirguna Shakti, which cannot be seen, and which is devoid of all prakritic qualities. O lotus-born, be good enough to describe to me the real nature of that prakriti and purusha, and thus satisfy me. O Lord of creation, I practiced severe austerities in the Shveta Dvipa, the white island, so that I might realize and see the Nirguna, highest self, and the Nirguna Shakti, the supreme goddess. I saw there many other Mahatmas, high-class spiritual persons, who attained Siddhis, practicing tapasya with their passions and anger conquered. But I did not realize, nor did I see anything about that Nirguna, highest self. Father, I did not despair. Again and again, I continued with my ascetic practices, but still I failed. Father, you have been so successful as to see that beautiful Shakti with qualities. I have heard about her from you. But how and of what sort is that invisible, attributeless energy, as well as that Nirguna Purusha? Please narrate and explain all these and satisfy my desires that always reign in my breast. Vyasa said, O king, thus asked by Narada, the lord of creation, the grandsire of the Lokas, smiled and began to speak the truth in the following words. O best of Munis, the form of the Nirguna Purusha, the supreme spirit beyond the Prakriti qualities, cannot exist or be visible, for everything that comes within the range of sight is transitory. How can then that eternal spirit have form, and how can he become visible? O Narada, the Nirguna energy, the, the, the Nirguna Shakti, or Nirguna Purusha, comes not easily within the range of knowledge, but both of them can be realized by the Munis in their meditation, within their consciousness. Prakriti and Purusha have no beginning nor end. They can be realized only through Sraddha. Those that have no Sraddha can never realize them. Narada, the universal consciousness that is felt in all the beings, know that as the highest self. Uh, the shakti that is universal and is seen always in all the beings, know that as the highest self, the consciousness and the energy that are everywhere. O blessed one, that purusha and prakriti pervade everywhere and exist in all things. In this universe, nothing can exist without the presence of both of them. Both of them are the highest intelligent self, nirguna, without any tinge of, tinge of impurity and undecaying. The one form that is a combination of these two is always to be meditated upon in the heart. What is Shakti is the highest self. What is the highest self is the highest Shakti. O Narada, nobody can ascertain the subtle difference between these two. O Narada, merely the study of all the Shastras and the Vedas with their Angas, without renunciation, does not enable one to ascertain the difference between these two. O child, this whole universe, moving and non-moving, comes out of ahankara. How can one ascertain the above difference, even if he tries for 100 kalpas, unless one frees oneself from ahankara? The jivas are saguna. 
How can the Sagunas see the Nirguna one with their physical eyes? Therefore, O intelligent one, try to see the Saguna only within your heart until you free yourself from the material qualities and thus be fit to realize the Nirguna Brahman. O best of Munis, if the tongue and eyes be affected with overbiliousness, the pungent taste and the yellow color do not appear as they appeared before. So the hearts of jivas, overpowered with material qualities, are quite unfit for realization of the Nirguna Brahman. O Narada, that heart has to come out of Ahankara. How can then that heart be free from Ahankara? Until one becomes able to cut asunder all connections with qualities, the seeing of that Nirguna Brahman is impossible. No sooner one is totally free from Ahankara than the Nirguna Brahman is at once seen by him within his heart. Narada said, O best of the devas, Ahankara is threefold, sattvic, rajasic, and tamasic. Describe in detail the differences between these three subdivisions as well as the real nature of the gunas. Also describe to me about that knowledge, knowing which will lead to my salvation. Also describe in detail the characteristics of the several gunas in due order. Brahma said, O sinless one, the energy of Ahankara is of three kinds, Jnana Shakti, Kriya Shakti, and Artha Shakti, also called Dravya Shakti. The power by which knowledge is produced or obtained is the Sattvic Ahankara. The power by which action or activity or motion is produced is the Rajasic Ahankara. And that by which material things or objects of the senses are generated is called the Tamasic Ahankara. Um, in other words, these are the processes of pure consciousness, of knowing, um, the processing of information, uh, the process uh, uh, the um, rajasic is dynamic movement, energy, and the tamasic is solidity, matter, uh, matter itself. O Narada, thus I have described to you in due order the threefold ahankaras. Now, I describe to you their merits and workings in detail here. Out of the dravya shakti of the tamasic ahankara comes sound, touch, form, taste, and smell. From these five qualities, the five tanmatras, or the five subtle elements, are produced. Sound is the quality of akasha. Touch is the quality of vayu. The form is the quality of agni, meaning the visible form. The taste is the quality of jala. And the smell is the quality of prithivitattva. O Narada, these ten gross and subtle materials can, when combined, become endowed with power to work out results in the shape of earth, water, fire, etc. And when the Panchi Karana process is combined, the building of the whole cosmos takes place as a natural consequence of the Tamasa Ahankara, endowed with the energy of generating material substances. Now hear what are produced by the Rajasic energy. The five organs of hearing, touch, taste, sight, and smell, called the five Jnanendriyas, mouth, hands, feet, anus, and the organs of generation, called the five Karmendriyas, and prana, apana, vyana, samana, and udana, uh, udana, the five vayus within the body. The creation out of these 15 substances is called the rajasic energy. Um, in other words, those objects are tamasic, which are inanimate, non-living matter. And those objects are rajasic, which are biologically alive, that they have senses and they have um, biological processes and motions within their body. Narada. All these organs of senses and actions endowed with the Kriya Shakti, called the Karanas, and the materials fashioned out of them are called the Chidanavrutti, or Maya. O Narada, from the Sattvic Ahankara are produced the five presiding rulers of the five internal organs, named Dik, or the Directions, Vayu, Surya, Varuna, and the twins, the Ashvini Kumaras, and the four presiding rulers of the fourfold divisions of Antakarana, uh, Budhi, uh, Budhi, Manas, Ahankara, and Chitta, are named Chandra, Brahma, Rudra, and Kshetragnya. Um, so Chandra is the ruler of the Budhi, Brahma, the ruler of the Manas, Rudra, the ruler of the Ahankara, and Kshetragnya of the Chitta. 
Thus, the above five organs of senses, the five organs of action, the five vayus, and mind. Those 16 substances are reckoned as the sattvic creation. O child, the highest self has two forms, one gross and the other subtle. The formless self, the consciousness incarnate, as it were, is the first form. The rishis consider this formless self to be the primary cause, the, the primary and ultimate cause, of all this phenomenal cosmos. The second form, um, and, and this can only be known by the best jnanis and not by others. The second form is the gross form for the meditation of the second class qualified persons, thus the sages say. The second form, um, the second class qualified persons being everyone except for the absolute foremost of jnanis should meditate upon the gross form. The second form of the supreme goddess is conditioned by inherent maya, time, space, and causation. This is also divided into gross and subtle, according as it is the outer or inner body of the second form and the form suited for the meditation of the third class and the second class devotees. My body is called sutratma. I will now tell you the gross body of Brahman, the highest self. O Narada, this my body and soul having the nature of a string or thread is called Hiranyagarbha. This is also the gross body of the Paramatman. Therefore, the Paramatman together with the Sutratma should also be worshipped. O Narada, I will now describe to you the outer gross body of Brahman, the highest self. Hear it attentively. If one hears it with faith and devotion, one is sure to get salvation. I have mentioned to you before the five subtle elements called the five tanmatras. These now, when the panchikarana process is done, are converted into the five gross elements. Now hear what the panchikarana process means. Suppose you are to create the gross element of water. Divide into two equal parts the subtle element of water. Divide also the other four elements into two equal parts, respectively. Now set apart the first half of each of the five elements. Divide the second half of each of the elements into four equal parts. Mix the first half of each of the elements with each of the fourth part of the other four elements, and you get one gross element. Similarly, you get the other four, uh, by the same way is how you get the other four gross elements. For example, you want to get the gross element of water. With the half of the subtle element of water, mix one fourth of the halves of the other elements. So in other words, one eighth. Um, so you have, so in other words, to, to derive gross um, gross jala tattva, you take half subtle jala tattva and one eighth each of subtle ether, fire, air, and earth. And this will produce the gross element of water and so on. When the five gross elements are thus produced, consciousness then enters into these elements as their presiding deities. Next comes the feeling of egoism or I-ness, identifying itself with the body thus created out of the five elements, that I am this body, and so forth. This great I, the great consciousness creating and considering the cosmos as its body, is called the Bhagavan, Adi Deva, Narayana, or Vaishvanara. When, by the Panchikarana process, the five gross elements, earth, ether, air, etc., are solidified and get their clear, definite forms, one, two, three, four, and five qualities are seen to exist in ether, air, fire, water, and earth, respectively. In other words, one quality in ether, two in air, three in fire, four in water, five in earth. Thus, ether has one quality only, that is sound. The air has got two qualities, sound and touch. The fire possesses three, sound, touch, and form. Again, form meaning visu visual form. The water has got four qualities, sound, touch, form, and taste. The earth has got five, sound, touch, taste, form, and smell. And by the various combinations of these five gross elements has produced this grand cosmos, the great body of Brahma. Similar to the sum total of jivas is produced from the several parts of the whole Brahmanda. These jivas are 84 lakhs, so the sages say. Um, the 84 lakhs is not counting the number of jivas, but the types, the types of bodies that they are born in. Thus ends the seventh chapter of the third skandha of Srimad Devi Bhagavatam, a Mahapuranam of 18,000 verses, on the creation of the tattvas and their, their presiding deities.
Chapter 8 On the Gunas and Their Forms Brahma said, O Narada, I have described to you what you asked me just now about the creation of this universe, etc. Now hear with attention the color of the three qualities, as well as their configuration and how they are seen to exist. The sattva guna is the source of pleasure and happiness, and when happiness comes, everything seems delighting. When integrity, truthfulness, cleanliness, faith, forgiveness, fortitude, mercy, bashfulness, peace, and contentment arise in one's heart, know certainly that there has arisen firmly the sattva guna in that person. The color of the sattva guna is white. It makes one always like dharma and have faith towards good purposes and discard one's tendencies towards bad objects. The rishis, the seers of truth, classify sraddha under the three headings, sattvic, rajasic, and tamasic. The quality rajas, the rajoguna, is of red color. Wonderful and is not pleasant. It is the source of all troubles. There is no doubt in this. The intelligent should understand that rajas has certainly arisen in him when his mind is filled with hatred, enmity, quarrelsome feelings, pride, stupefaction, uneasiness, sleeplessness, lack of faith, egoism, vanity, and arrogance. The quality tamas is of black color. From tamas arises laziness, ignorance, sleep, poverty, fear, quarrels, miserliness, insincerity, anger, aberration of intellect, violent atheism, and finding fault with others. The wise should think that tamas has overpowered him when the above qualities are found to possess him. When this tamas quality is attended with the tamasi faith, then it becomes, or, or the tamasi sraddha, then it becomes the source of pain to others. In absence of the tamas, tamas in absence of tamasi sraddha, is a source of pain only to oneself. But combined with tamasi sraddha, it spreads. The well wishers should manifest in themselves the sattva qualities, control the rajasic qualities, maintain them but under control and destroy the tamasic qualities, or try to get rid of them entirely from oneself. These three qualities are always found to remain intermingled with one another, and each of them has always an inherent tendency to overcome the others, and therefore they are always, as it were, at war with one another. They never have a separate existence from one another. Never is found anywhere only one sattva quality to the exclusion of others, the rajas and tamas. They are always in some intermixture. And what what varies is simply the proportions of predominance in any given being and, and, and at any given time. Similar as the case with the Rajas or Tamas, they remain intermingled and depend on one another. O Narada, now hear in detail which two qualities remain in twins, knowing which one is freed from this ocean of the transmigration of existence. I have realized these, therefore you ought not to have any uncertainties on these points. The reality of these is especially felt when it is really understood and when its effects begin to manifest themselves. O oh, high-minded one, no one is able to realize these at once. It requires to be heard and then meditated upon. It also depends on one's natural capability and merits due to past karmas. Suppose one hears of the sacred places of pilgrimages and is filled with rajasic devotion. He goes out to those places and sees what he has heard about. There he performs ablutions, makes offerings, and gives rajasic gifts, stays there for some time. But all this he does under the influence of the rajasic quality. And when he returns home, he finds himself not free from lust, anger, love, and hatred. He remains the same that he was before. Therefore, in this case, O Narada, a man hears, but he does not realize the purifying effects of those holy places. O best of Munis, when he does not find any benefit from the holy place of pilgrimage, it is equivalent to his not at all hearing of the place. O best of Munis, the effect of visiting the sacred places of pilgrimages is then said to accrue to any individual when he becomes freed from his sins, just as the fruit of cultivating fields is said to occur when the cultivator gets the ripened harvest out of his labor and enjoys the produce of his fields. O Narada, lust, anger, covetousness, delusion, thirst, hatred, love, vanity, malice, jealousy, non-forgiveness, unrest, all these indicate that there is tapam, 
And until these are purged out of one's body and mind, man lives in papam. If the visiting of the sacred places of pilgrimages does not enable one to overcome the above passions, then the labors in going to those places are in vain, i.e. those labors merely are the results, just as the toil only undergone by the cultivator is his only result, and is not met with any reward when there is no harvest. Lo, the cultivator takes hard labor to clear his fields and cultivate the hard soil. He then sows the valuable seeds because this is considered as doing good. Next, in expectation of the harvest, he undergoes a good deal of pains day and night to protect his fields and goes down to sleep in the cold season in the forests surrounded by tigers and other dangerous animals. But alas, locusts coming eat away and destroy all the crops to the utter disappointment of the cultivator. All his labors were spent in vain. So, O oh, Narada, the labor taken by one in going to the holy places yields pains and pains only instead of success and happiness. If done, in a rajasic spirit. When the sattva quality grows in abundance as a consequence of reading the Vedanta and the other shastras, this passion comes towards the rajasic and the tamasic qualities and things, and the sattva quality overpowers the rajas and tamas. Similarly, when the rajasic quality grows in abundance as a natural consequence of greed and avarice, then it overpowers sattva and tamas. So by delusion, when the tamasic quality grows in abundance, it overpowers the sattva and the rajasic qualities. O oh, Narada, I will now speak to you in detail about the overpowering of these qualities by one another. When the sattva quality grows in predominance, the mind rests in religious ideas and things. It no more thinks of those external things, the products of the rajas and tamas qualities. Rather, it wants to enjoy the sattvic things. Wealth, religious affairs, yagnas that can be acquired or performed without any trouble. Um, in other words, those yagnas which are easy to perform, not great undertakings, which are more rajasic. Then that individual yearns after salvation and renounces his pursuits after the rajasic and tamasic objects. Thus, O Narada, first try to conquer the rajas, and then the tamas. Then the sattva becomes pure. When the rajasic quality grows in preponderance, the individual imbibes the rajasic faith abandons his own sanatana dharma and practices against his religious instructions. Under the rajasic propensities, one is eager to amass wealth and enjoy the rajasic things. The rajas drives away the sattva and curbs the tamas. Narada. When the tamasic quality grows in preponderance, the faith in the Vedas and in the dharma shastras entirely disappears. Imbibing the tamasic faith, the individual squanders away his wealth and is always engaged in quarrels um, and petty feelings, envy, violence, and never enjoys peace. The individual with the tamasic qualities in excess overpowers the rajasic and sattvic qualities and becomes angry, wicked, and a great cheat, and does everything that he likes without any regard to his superiors. Narada, thus you see that of, this, of these three qualities, no one can remain entirely alone, free from the other qualities. These always remain in twos or threes. The sattva can never exist without the rajas. The rajas can never exist without the tamas. And these two qualities, and these two qualities, sattva and rajas, can never exist without tamas. Again, tamas cannot exist without rajas and sattva. These qualities act and react always in twos or threes, never one by itself. They never exist separately. They live in pairs or threes and are the originators of each other. These qualities are of the nature of procreating things. In other words, sattva originates the rajas or tamas. Again, the rajas originates sometimes sattva and tamas. Again, the tamas sometimes originates sattva and rajas. Thus, they generate each other as the earthen pots and earth are each other's mutual causes. Devadatta, Vishnumitra, and Yagnyadatta. These three united perform any action. So these three qualities united reside in the buddhi, or the intellect of the jivas, and generate their sense perceptions. Just as the husband and wife get into a couple, the qualities get into couples. The sattva with rajas forms the couple rajas sattva. So sattva rajas forms another couple where the sattva predominates. So sattva and rajas forms each with tamas, the other couples. Narada said, O Dvaipayana, hearing thus about these three qualities from my father, I asked him again these questions. Thus ends the eighth chapter of the Mahapuranam Srimad Devi Bhagavatam containing the description of the gunas of 18,000 verses by Maharshi Veda Vyasa.
Narada said, Father, you have described to me the characteristics of the three, guna, uh, the three gunas. Though I have drunk the sweet juice from your lotus-like mouth, still I am not quite satisfied. Kindly describe to me in, due, in detail, in due order, how I can recognize clearly the three gunas so that I can get the highest peace of mind. Vyasa said, O king, the creator of the world, Brahma, originated from the Rajoguna, asked by his high-minded son Narada, began to speak in the following terms. O Narada, I myself do not possess fully the complete knowledge of the three gunas, but as far as I know, I am telling that to you. The pure sattva guna is not found alone to exist anywhere. It manifests itself always in mixed condition and combination with the other gunas. As a beautiful woman, well decorated with ornaments and endowed with amorous gestures, gives delight on the one hand to her husband, father, mother, and friends, and on the other hand becomes a source of pain and delusion to her rival wives, so the sattva guna, personified as a beautiful woman, metaphorically speaking, engenders the sattvic happiness of the mind to some individual at one time, and at another time becomes a source of pain to the same individual, or at one and the same time becomes a source of happiness to one individual and a source of pain to another. Thus the rajas or tamas quality, personified respectively as a beautiful woman, becomes a source of pain or delusion to an individual at one time and at another time a source of happiness to the same person. So it is easily seen that one guna cannot remain single. It remains in union with the other two gunas. It is very possible that a man possessing the sattvic quality at any time can be said not to possess only the sattvic quality, but also the rajas and the tamas to a certain degree. At any subsequent time, the rajas might get predominance. And the man may be in circumstances requiring money or so forth, but due to his sattva guna beforehand, he did not collect money and therefore he feels pain afterwards. So with the rajas. Or it may be thus. Suppose an earning member is sattvic. He earns just sufficient to meet his wants. But his family members require more money for they are rajasic. Therefore the earning member is happy for his sattvic quality, but the other members are unhappy for his sattvic quality. A man is as it were wedded to the three wives, sattva, rajas, and tamas. O Narada. When the three qualities remain each in their own real natures, then the effects produced by them also remain always the same. No changes are perceived owing to the differences of time or person. But when they get combined, then each of them produces effects sometimes counter to their natures. A young, beautiful woman, shy, modest, and of sweet qualities, well-versed in her religious learning and full of good behavior, skilled in love practices and full of sweet sentiments, becomes a source of loving delight to her beloved and also a source of pain to her rival wives, so each of these three qualities assumes no doubt different aspects according to the differences in time and in the nature of the person. O Narada, as we continue sticking with this metaphor he's using, as one woman gives pain and delusion to her rival wives and gives pleasure to her husband and friends, so the sattva guna, when perverted, gives pain and delusion to persons. As the police officers and constables are on the one hand delighting to the saints, troubled by thieves, and on the other hand, sources of pain and confusion to the thieves and robbers. Again, as the heavy shower of rain in a pitch dark night in the rainy season, when the sky is overclouded and when there are flashes of lightning and thunder, is on the one hand a source of highest delight to a farmer who has all the seeds and necessary things and implements, and on the other hand is a source of pain to the unfortunate householder whose house is not yet completely thatched with grass, or who has not been able to collect his beams and grass for necessary roofing. And a source of utter bewildering confusion to the young woman whose husband is abroad and expected back at that time. So the three gunas produce contrary results when perverted by contact with the remaining gunas, instead of what they would have, would have produced had they not been so perverted. O oh child, again I speak to you of the characteristics of the three gunas. The sattva guna is pure, clear, illuminating, light, uh, light as in, um, in weight, not light as in luminous, and white. When the senses, eyes, etc., and the limbs are felt very light without any heaviness, and the heart and brain feel clear, and when there is dispassion towards the rajasic and the tamasic enjoyments, when those enjoyments don't really appeal to you. Know then that the sattva quality has grown in predominance in one's body. When there is a tendency to yawn, when there is rigidity and suppression of the functions of faculties, and when one feels drowsiness, consider um, that the rajasic quality has gone to excess not in an inflamed and fiery state, but in a sort of sluggish state. Again, when one seeks after quarrels and goes to another village, I believe this is an error. 
in fact. It says Rajas, but that should have referred to Tamas. And this next one, which says Tamas, should in fact refer to Rajas. Again, when one seeks after quarrels and goes to another village, when one is always restless and ready to fight, when one feels heaviness in one's body, as if wrapped by a very heavy darkness, when one's limbs, it's a mixture, when one's limbs and senses are heavy and obscure, when one's mind is vacant and when one does not like to go to sleep, know that the tamas has increased too much, not enough. Um, I would say that the last two actually describe combinations of rajas and tamas with each other. Narada said, O oh, Father, you have described the different characteristics of the three gunas, but I cannot understand how they all act in conjunction. As those who are enemies to one another do not work united, so these gunas of opposite characteristics are enemies, as it were, to one another. How can they then act in unison? Kindly explain this to me. Brahma said, O oh, Narada, the three gunas may be likened to a lamp. As the lamp manifests a certain object, so these three gunas united do manifest or reveal a certain thing. See, the wick, oil, and flame are all of different characteristics. Though the oil goes against fire, still it unites with the fire. The oil, wick, and fire, though running against each other, all these united serve the one common purpose of illumining, revealing a certain object. So, O oh Narada, all the three gunas, though of contrary natures, go to prove the same thing. Narada said, O oh son of Satyavati, the lotus-born Brahma thus described the three gunas as born of Prakriti, and they are the causes of this universe. When I heard of you about the nature of Prakriti, what I heard of you about the nature of Prakriti, I have now described before you. Vyasa said, O king, what you ask me, I asked before the same to Narada, and he described thus, as I have told you, to me about the characteristics and the effects of the three gunas in regular order and in detail. O king, wherever in the Shastras, whatever is said, the essence of all that is this, that the highest energy, the supreme Shakti, the great goddess who is pervading the universe is always with qualities and without qualities, according to the differences in the manifestation. This supreme Shakti is to be worshipped with the highest devotion. The Brahman, the Purusha, the supporter, the ultimate substratum, the highest energy considered as the male principle, though it is undecaying, supreme and full, is still without any desires or emotions. It is not able to accomplish any action without the help of its inherent Shakti. This Mahamaya, the supreme Shakti is doing all the functions, real and unreal, of the universe. Brahma, Vishnu, Rudra, Surya, Chandra, Indra, the twin Ashvins, the Vasus, Vishva, Karma, Kubera, Varuna, Agni, Vayu, Pusha, the Sadanan, and Ganesha, all are united with Shakti and can do their respective functions, else they are unable to move themselves. Therefore, O king, know that supreme goddess Mahamaya as the cause of this universe. O Lord of men, worship this goddess, perform yajnas in honor of her, and worship her with the highest devotion. O king, that Mahamaya is Mahalakshmi, she is Mahakali, she is Mahasaraswati, she is the goddess of all the Bhutas, and she is the cause of all causes. That all peaceful, easily worshipped, and the ocean of mercy, when worshipped, fulfills all the desires of her devotees. What to say, the mere utterance of her name is sufficient for the granting of the, of the desires. In days of yore, Brahma, Vishnu, Maheshwara, and all the devas and many other self-controlled ascetics worshipped her to attain liberation. O king, what shall I speak now about her more than this? If one takes her name, even with indistinctness, she grants the desired purposes, even if they are quite unattainable. In the midst of a forest, in the sight of tigers and other ferocious animals, if one becoming, becoming afraid... Utter, cries aloud her seed mantra twice. Ay, ay, without the bindu, incorrectly, instead of aim, aim. She still grants immediately his desires. O best of kings, there, an, there is an example of Satyavrata on this point. But the mere utterance of the name of Bhagavati gives unforeseen results has been witnessed by us and other high-minded munis. Also in the assembly of the Brahmanas, I have heard fully many sages quoting in detail many instances on the above point. O king, there was a Brahman named Satyavrata, quite illiterate, a thorough blockhead. Once he heard the letter ai, ai being uttered by a pig, and in course of a talk, he himself uttered incidentally that letter and thereby became one of the best pundits. The goddess Devi, the ocean of mercy, hearing the letter ai being pronounced by that Brahman, became very glad and made him the best of the poets. Here ends the ninth chapter of the third skandha on the characteristics of the gunas and Srimad Devi Bhagavatam. The Mahapuranam of 18,000 verses by Maharshi Veda Vyasa.
And it is 10 o'clock. I think that's a good stopping point. Uh, we next get into further questions by King Janamejaya and the start of a new story. So I think that makes a perfect stopping point for us. Thank you, Devala. Jay Ma. Jay Ma, thank you very much for coming. May I uh, ask a question? Yeah, sure, go ahead. So amazing, amazing uh, uh, verse today. I mean, like just that utter Ma throughout. But then, of course, the, the gunas today, in depth, mm -hmm. thoughts about those. Yeah. And uh, so what's going on? Would you, if you'd be able to provide your insight and any kind of paraphrase and your, your, your knowledge, uh, understanding of when they're talking about, you know, Thomas and Rajas, yeah. it's in a negative context, usually, like, you know, try to be sattvic. Usually. Right? Yeah. But here today, we just had the most interesting verses about the necessity of Thomas and Rajas. Yes. And how they actually co-create Sattva. Yes. They all give okay. rise to each other. So, and it, 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 indeed, creation, Sattva alone cannot create. Creation of is generally a function of Rajas. That's why Brahma, the creator, is is um, primarily composed of Rajoguna. Right. Yeah. Cre Rajas is like the the fiery spark, the drive that right. gives rise to things. It, Rajas is absolutely necessary to create pretty much anything. But they Sattva, also talk Sattva down Sattva on it. They talk it. as if it's in, in balance. What's that? Yeah, yeah. If it's in balance, then it, uh, any of them in imbalance, particularly Tamas mm -hmm. or Rajas, but, but even Sattva, any of them in imbalance can be harmful. How would you describe um, imbalanced Sattva? Imbalanced I thought Sattva. Sattva is balanced. Um, is Sattva, it isn't Sattva the essence of balance? Sattva isn't Sattva the essence of balance. Sattva, I would it say, is, is the essence. I, I would say sattva is the essence of um, clarity. Yeah. I would say it's the essence wow. of clarity. Um, the, okay. examples, the examples that Brahma gave to Narada right in this reading about imbalanced sattva are, for example, um, oh, yeah. for example, if you have dependents, if you have, a, if you have family members depending on you to provide for them, oh, yeah. too much sattva might inhibit you from doing so. Um, and even if it doesn't cause you to suffer because you are so sattvic and in, in such mental peace, you might be causing other people to suffer if they were depending on you and you, because of your excess of sattva, are not providing for them. In that case, the course of dharma wow. might be better served by you becoming less sattvic and increasing rajoguna. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. Is there a reference point to knowing when to go which direction? <laughs> you uh, know, like... Yeah, joy and suffering. Joy and suffering. Uh, like, it, the, the, mo the most acute reference point is suffering. If you're suffering, then you should go in a different direction. If you're suffering I... from, if you're suffering from depression, and by that, I don't mean the clinical condition of depression. I mean the general tendency of depression. You feel glum and down and bleak and empty. You probably have an excess of tamas. Um, and, and you should go away from that. If you are suffering from the opposite, um, anxiety or anger or like too much fight, like restlessness and drive, then you probably have an excess yeah. of rajas, too much rajas. Um, Rarely, our world tends to push people toward an excess of rajas or sattvas. It's rare that you would have an excess of sattva and that you should correct away from that. Um, but we did get an example of that given. Um, so, so suffering is the main one. But, but even if you're not suffering, um, then joy, 
the, your joy, your ability to bring joy to others, and your ability to bring higher joy to yourself. You can, can you you can tweak them toward that goal. Yeah. And is joy associated with sattva? Pure joy is, but there is joy of all the three. Thomas, right, Thomas like, temporary, like a temporary joy, or. Well, there, there's, well, yes, all of it is temporary. Any, any joy born of gunas uh, is temporary. Like tamasic, uh, tamasic, tamasic joy is like the joy of laziness, like lying, like if you're like lying around comfortably, not doing anything. It can be super pleasurable. That's tamasic pleasure. Rajasic joy is like sex, delicious food, like riches, like excess, and like richly enjoying material stuff. That's rajasic joy. It's very real joy. It's temporary. Wow. Sattvic joy tends to be the most um, pure and stable. Um, and that's the smooth joy of the clarity of consciousness. That you're not getting overpowered wow. by external sensory stuff. You found your inner joy. That's sattvic joy. And it tends to be the steadiest. Um, it's not always the flashiest and most immediately strong. Wow. That's why rajasic joy, especially, can often appeal more than sattvic joy at first. But yeah, sattvic joy tends to be the um, the steadiest because it is the most internally sustainable. It's the least dependent on external circumstances. Wow. Yeah. Now, uh, if, if you don't mind, I mean, you, you can be as brief as you want, but. Um... You know, I always hear about like uh, if you're tamasic, yeah, it ain't bad to get a little rajasic, have a cup of coffee. Yeah, for know? sure, get for sure. Off your butt. For sure, but definitely. Is, so is the balance of rajas tamas? You know, if you're, if you're too rajasic, yeah, um, it, tamas yeah. can help balance the rajas. Tamas? Right. Either way, either way, it can work. Um, I would, I would, I would generally say that it's a better first recourse to try to balance rajas with sattva, but in some cases right. that might just not do it. Sattva is not particularly strong. Uh, of all the qualities of sattva, strength is not one of them. Um, and so, really? if you have a, if you have a lot of rajas going on, sattva is probably not going to stop it. But tamas might. Tamas might kind of dull the heat of the fire a little bit. Yeah. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Wow, man. Thanks so much, Dave. I love you, dude. Yeah, thank you very much for Dave, coming. And Dave, and Nate, Nate, Dave, Nate, awesome to see you, dude. Love you, bro. Yeah, I love yeah, you thank, too. Thank, thank you, you for guys. coming. Thank yeah, you for coming. Yeah, thank you guys so much. This was uh, this was very special. It's uh, it's it's all kind of like fresh for me, but uh, this was really this was really deep. It was really cool. Nice. Well, so, yeah, thank, you, thanks a lot for coming. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Love Day you guys. Ma. Thank you so much. <laughs> Day, Ma.